Yeah, thank you. We can do this now. We can just go back. We are the end of the piece. This is also very nice. Normally, we start studying a piece from the beginning, and today we learn how to work a piece starting from the end. This is not bad sometimes. Uh, we just try to find other cadence motions in the bass line. We'll find some other cadence motion in the bass line, just going back from the last one we played now. Yeah, I think, yes, this is okay. You can sign this one, but I think there are other. The next part maybe A to D. A to D, yes. And then other one. J to C, G to C, yes. This is just three measure before the end. At the end of the second line, of the second system of the page, you have G, C, this is again a cadence. And then, also D to G is a cadence. And then you go back and we already fixed the E to A. And then I think in this page, we don't have other perfect cadence, just going back. Other cadences. Uh, yeah, you mean the, what line is the? Ah, okay, so just from the beginning of the piece, uh, he says the between the first and the second line, the base motion is G to C. Okay, this is a cadence. And then, second line. Yes, we have uh, yes, we have A to D at the end of the second line, the beginning of the third line. Yeah. That would lead then the next part for a small cadence, but it's too quick. Uh huh. Yeah, of course. Uh, one of the questions is that uh, normally the perfect cadence in the music was connected with long notes, large notes. Sometimes you have a quick motion, but we can say the, treat, the um, treatment of quick motion could be very close to a concept of cadence in this time. So from the beginning, we have already a cadence between measure two and measure three, D to G. And then between measure three and measure four, G to C. And then again, between measure uh, six, so the end of the second line and the beginning, of the third line, and then again measure seven, uh, E to A, and so on, and the other way already. So if you count how many cadence or motion in this direction are in the piece, you already fixed the 50% of the piece. So the cadence was really very important as motion. If we look at the contemporary keyboard music, you find uh, toccatas or versetti in this time, in which normally you have three or sometimes also more cadence, depend of the length of the piece. And the connection between the cadence, among the cadence, was uh, sequences. So if we have to put together ingredients to create a, a 70s, early, early 17th century or end 16th century, a short piece, in the first mode, practically, what you have to do is just to use the three main cadences. Here we have ma more because the piece is larger than a little uh, intonation or little toccata. You have to put the three cadences in order, 
of course, the finalis. It must be at the end, not <laughs> the beginning. And in between, what you find are, and you have to use, are sequences. So patterns that normally are repeated. Now, now we leave the sequences. You know there are many kind of sequences used in this time. Are the descending fifth sequences. And you have, and so on. You have the ascending fifth. Etc. And if you look at Toccata by Andrea Giovanni Gabrieli or Sveling or Asler or Erbach, you find that the most part of the Toccata are based on cadences connected by sequences. Of course, the interesting thing is that the Toccata is not just a sort of chord, but you have Diminution, you have passaggi, ascending and descending line, different kind of figuration. This is, of course, the interesting element. So you can read 10 toccata in the first mode, and you find always different elements because of the different figuration. But you can find always the same cadences and the same uh, uh, sequences. Yeah, uh, just going back to the previous page where we have some rules suggested by Agazzari. Now we can work a little bit on this base and say, I just try to resume the most important observation of this treatise. And the first is the A, figures and numbers belong from the definition of interval in the counterpoint. So we have not to think about chords, but intervals in this time. And this is m very interesting. If you take, for example, the Rappresentazione di Anime di Corpo, the first oratorio by Emilio de Cavalieri, if, in you, if you look at the base, there are some figures. And the figures are not normally 6, 5, 3, but normally are 10, 11, 12, so the number are not this, because the concept was to use the number normally using the counterpoint. So the real distance between the bass and the other voices. So in Emilio de Cavalieri is very clear that the concept of continuo belongs from, from the, the concept, concept of counterpoint. And then the second thing, the bicordo, not the chord, is the primary entity in this time. So the most important thing is not many voices, but two voices together. So the interval was always the connection between one upper voice and the bass, not the relationship between the upper voices, but each upper voice is related to the bass. This is the counterpoint uh, concept of, of the time. Uh, and then the triad is always referred to the bass, um, okay, a real, a, a real hierarchy among the chords does not exist. So this is the consequence of what we said uh, before. In this time, there was not a concept of hierarchy in the chords. So tonic, subdominant, dominant. This is typical of the tonal system. In the 16th, 17th century, there was not a polarity in the music connecting this core, or sometimes could happen, but sometimes could be also different. We will see immediately when we go on to the, in trying to uh, write down the base, the figures on the base of Frescobaldi. And what we did, we have to refer to the modal system and to the cadences. So this is the basic uh, uh, elements we have to refer. And then you find, 10 essential rules to play a Toro bass uh, from the above mentioned sources. So uh, these are rules just uh, very quickly collected from uh, Grossi da Viadana, Banchieri, Agazzari, Bianciardi, and also uh, Banchieri. So the most important rules. The first we did exactly now, find the mode through the finalis. Cadences 
on the F, F major or the final is F major third. So the cadences on the finalis and the other cadences um, have, of course, the major third and had exactly what we did with it now. The second rule, this is written by Agazzari, every bass note is normally accompanied with third and fifth, except limi, except the E, on which you need to use third and six. This is also a very interesting rule. Can we try just to play the beginning of the piece? Who want to help me? Just the beginning of the, yeah, thank you very much. So we, I su suggest just a practical thing now. We uh, lose for a moment what happens in the soprano line. So we ignore completely what happens. Just we fix now our attention to the bass uh, in, and we create a situation which we don't have, and it happened very often this time, the soprano part in our score. We have just the bass line with nothing. So we ignore at the moment what happens. And okay, we say the first note is D. And uh, Agazzari suggests, okay, normally you have to accompany this note with two other parts, two other voices. And the best voices are the fifth and the third. Okay, can we try? Yeah, I think it was okay. Um, what uh, uh, he did was very good. Uh, when we are at the end of the second measure, he played uh, major third because D to, Z to G is a cadence. And if you look at the soprano part, you have F sharp, so the soprano is singing F sharp, but also ignoring what happens in the soprano parts, the motion, the best motion to connect this descending fifth was to use the major, the major third. Of course, the question is, uh, shall we start immediately from the beginning of the piece with the major third, or we can start with the minor third and then move to the major third uh, later. This is up to you to decide. Of course, the last word about this question is to look at the soprano melody. We can do this shortly at the beginning. The soprano is singing A, A, D, B flat, A, A. And we have the bass uh, line. What we can do to accompany, just can you play just staying in D minor? Da, 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 da. This is one possibility. So the harpsichord play the chord and then of course you know the sound is going very quickly and the soprano goes on. But if we play this at the organ or we have to uh, have a sound just keeping the notes during this measure. What happens with this B flat? What we can do? Another possibility. Yeah, okay, we use modern way of just to, to understand better. Yeah, can you try? Ta -da, ta -da. So, you did very well, already a little bit more complicated than only the fourth and the sixth. What happens, we have a D in the bass, and the beginning of the end of this D is the third and the fifth. But in between there is a change, because the interval of the soprano is changed. It's no more a fifth or an octave, it's a sixth. What you can do is the motion, six, four, three, five. This motion uh, we name today the plagal motion, but we, on the pedal was quite common in this, in, in this time, particularly in the accompaniment of the recitative in this time. Of course, you can use also uh, 
throw notes, uh, passaggio notes. This is another question we discuss later. This was quite, uh, quite common. You find the, in many mini pieces, also in written piece, when you have a long pedal note, one possibility is also with major third or Uh, by the way, we, I said at the beginning, we try to tell something about this development from the modal system to the tonal system. Um, not here, but there are other pieces in Frescobaldi and just later in Giacomo Carissimi, in which you have a pedal like here. And you don't find only these two uh, vertical situation, third, fifth, four, six, with minor third, no? and then again, third, fifth. But you find also situation a little bit more complex. Uh, one of these is this is exactly what we did now, and then so you find situation in which on the pedal of the bass on the finalis, you have three, okay, we use the modern idea, three chords. So the perfect chord, third, fifth, and then followed by the fourth and sixth, and then followed by this second, fourth, and seventh, major seven. There is a Many, there are many examples already in Frescobaldi a little bit, but I think the first interesting connection of these three elements appears in a, a recitativo of a cantata by Giacomo Carissimi. Uh, the cantata, the title of the cantata is Suonerà l'ultima tromba, the last trumpet with sound. It's something connected with the, the end of the world, uh, our death, and so on. So just be careful because your life is an end. So the last trumpet will sound and we have to present to God and to, to tell him what we did and to receive the judgment of what we did. So, and the cantata is for soprano solo and continuo. There is no trumpet, but of course at the beginning the, the melody of the soprano is suonera, like a trumpet. So just the, in this case it's not the instrument that try to imitate the voice, but it's the voice trying to imitate the instrument. And in the middle, there is a, after this first aria, a recitativo, and in this recitativo is in G. Now I play in D just to stay on our score. And the soprano sings something like this. So you have the bass with no finger, we, we don't know numbers, we don't we know um, uh, uh, figuration, and and what you can do, of course, you can play ta 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 da 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 ta da 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 da. You just leave the uh, cembalo uh, without sound; it works. The other possibility is this. And this is exactly this uh, connection, third and fifth, four and six, second, fourth, and seven. Just, I mention this thing because I think this is one of the elements that in the 17th century push in the new direction of the tonal system. Because just looking from our point of view, what we have here is the pedal, and on the pedal you have three chords that represent the three elements of the tonal system. The chord on the tonic, the chord on the subdominant, of course the pedal is the tonic, but this is subdominant, G, and the chord on the dominant with seven. So this is the first connection of three polarity 
on the base of a pedal. So I think the recitative in the 17th century took a very important rule, pushing in the direction, is not the only one, of course, in the direction of the tonal system. Uh, there is a toccata by Frescobaldi, La Toccata Settima uh, of the second book, in which we have the beginning. So three, uh, five, eight, two, four, seven. And then the major third. It's a little bit like here, so the beginning is minor. And then you have this, and then. So maybe we can have. So you can also hear, like in the seventh toccata by Frescobaldi, start with minor third. And then, of course, here there is not the space for the two, four, seven chords, but just for the six, four chord, and then the major, major third. Yeah, thank you very much. And then what happens later is quite simple. We have third and fifth on D, we have third and fifth on G, on the third measure, we have third and fifth on C, and then we have this C sharp. And just going back to the rules suggested by the treatise of the time, we go to the third rule. When the low part avrà il diesis, so when the bass had the sharp, essa s'accompagni per lo più. Per lo più says not always, but for the most, almost for the most part with third and six. So when you find a sharp, C sharp like here, or F sharp, or G sharp in the bass, uh, what the theorists of the time suggest is, don't accompany it with third and fifth, but maybe it's better third and six. Now, of course, we are absolutely, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 this is Limi, li we will speak a little bit later. We are now just a beginner for this discussion, and we ask why? Why all the theorists of the time, Agazzari, Bianciardi, or they say when the bass has a, a sharp, you have to accompany it with third and sixth, not third and fifth. What do you think about? Yeah, this is one of the, the questions. So, of course, if you have this, if I play this G sharp, no, I change because it's out of tune, F sharp. <laughs> it's not better, but a little bit. Uh, if I play the third and the fifth, I have two possibilities on F sharp, of course. The third is okay, A. And if I play the natural fifth, yeah, I have a diminished fifth, or I play C sharp. This is a possibility. But very often, for example, if I take G sharp, this is better. If I play third and fifth with the perfect fifth, this is a disaster because in a mint tone, I don't have D sharp, but, but I have E flat. So the, it has to do with the motion, it has to do with the, the, the um, uh, temperament of the time. It has to do also with the counterpointal connection. Normally, if I have a sharp, this sharp is going up. And of course, the best motion, if the sharp is going up for a semitone, you can start with an imperfect consonance, the counterpointal theory says, the sixth going to a perfect consonance, the sixth to the fifth. If you start with the diminished, this is very bad, but if you start also with a perfect consonance, then you have some problem. You have parallel fifth, or if you change, you have a perfect consonant going to an imperfect consonance with this not very beautiful effect. 
So what I want to say very sharply is that this rule is related to the counterpointal rules. So a semitone motion normally is accompanied with an interval that allows you to move from an unperfect consonance, like a six, to a perfect consonance. This is the best motion. Of course, in three parts, the middle voice, the, the third part, just move with parallel third. In the case of our piece, we have C sharp, This is also very interesting to understand one important thing that normally the counterpoint for this kind of music was based on two voices. So what happens in the other parts, in the third part, normally was just a, something like a parallel motion with unperfect consonances with one of the other voices, the third or the sixth. When you play, for example, other connection of this time, three parts, the bass going up a fourth, the cadence we had before, and you accompany with third and fifth. What happens? You have a very interesting connection between the C and the E. This is the counterpointal motion from a unperfect consonance to a perfect consonance. And the rule says you have to play the semitone in one of the voices. And the other voice, parallel thirds, no more. So this is quite common in the 17th, 16th, 17th century. Even if you feel that there are three parts, very often the counterpoint is between two parts and the third parts just move with third and six with one of the other two, the other two parts. So we are now here. We just can try to go on a little bit for a few minutes. Uh, who can help to play a little bit from this C sharp? We go to the end of the uh, third line, the beginning of the fourth line. Just try. Okay. So, kind of problem. Just three parts from the C sharp. We have third and six. Yeah, from the C sharp. And then D, and then again D. And then we have A. And then we have D. Yes, we uh, gave the writer. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. This is a good idea. If you look at the text, uh, contro il gran nome tuo morte disarmi. And there is dot. This is the end of the phrase. And in the base, you have A to D. And I think this is really the end of the first phrase of the piece. And this is the case in which, as uh, uh, previously said, we can have the major third also on the finalis, because this is the end of the piece, of the, the phrase. So from here, uh -huh. can you try from here? Yes, of course you can apply in the cadence the dissonance. The third step is look at what happens in the soprano. But I say we ignore at the moment. But if you look at what happens at the soprano, the soprano is singing, singing something like this. Um, so. So, so what, what we, we can, can play also here with the soprano is the sixth form. form. No, so, so soprano is in uh, F, so, so F, D, A, and, and then the cadence with dissonance. dissonance. 
This cadence. Ta 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 ta. This is the typical already Renaissance cadence. Here the change is the soprano voice with this jump down. But the cadence, if you ignore the soprano, is this. This is another cadence to memorize. It's very important. You find thousand times in the vocal music of the Renaissance, in the madrigal. So, three, five, four, six, four, five, three, five, three, five with major third. This is a, the real concluding cadence, stronger than this one. And here is interesting, we are at the end of the phrase. We already encountered other cadences before, but this is the first in which we have this motion. This, we say today, cadenza composta, composed cadence, double cadence. So you have three, five, six, four, dissonance, consonance, and, and this is the real end of a phrase. And what happens after, now we have to conclude here, the beginning is what we say, uh, mutatio modi. So he leaves the Dorian and starts with another completely different key, but we will see tomorrow what happens. What I suggest to you, just don't think about, uh, understand too much things, but just try to fix some ideas. And if you have time this afternoon, write down some figures, some uh, numbers, just going through the piece, looking at the other rules. Tomorrow we will repeat other rules uh, I fixed there from Agazzari. So, and go through the piece and just to fix what is possible to do, just using these rules. So, uh, trying to avoid that your here, based on the tonal concept, uh, push you in other direction. But just try to be very elemental, following the basic rules suggested by the treaties of the time. And tomorrow we will continue. Questions? I think it's time for lunch. So we will can go to our hotel to have lunch. Thank you. Thank you.